All right, good afternoon and welcome to the Center for Future Educators College and Career Readiness Week. My name is Dr. Jean Del Coley and I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Future Educators. The CFE's goal for this week is to pull in experts from around the state uh, to help us explore the many facets of the education profession. This week, you'll hear from teachers, administrators, college and university personnel, education support professionals, and even a licensed parent educator as they all discuss what it takes to get students college and career ready. We thank them for all their time and wisdom this week. Our theme today is Leading Beyond the Classroom and it features some of New Jersey's finest administrators. Our esteemed panel includes Diane Cummins, 2004 New Jersey State Teacher of the Year and former Assistant Superintendent from Clearview Regional High School, Terrence Johnson, Assistant Principal of Cumberland Regional High School and Assistant Principal of the Year for 2019-2020, Tammy McHale, Principal of Haddonfield Memorial High School, Nicole Moore, principal of Indian Mills School in Shemong, and Jean Musi, 2009 New Jersey State Teacher of the Year and principal of Slackwood Elementary School in Lawrence Township. Our wonderful co-hosts for today uh, are CFE student ambassadors, our wonderful students, Abigail Bordeaux, a junior from South Brunswick High School, and joining us shortly will be Olivia Gray, a sophomore from Passaic County Technical Institute. Welcome to all of you and thank you so much for being with us today. We appreciate your, your time and being here. So uh, let's, let's do a little bit of an introduction. I said who you were, but tell us a little, about, a little more about yourself. Um, so I'm Diane Cummins. I am the former assistant superintendent um, from Clearview Regional High School. I spent 13 years there as an administrator. Prior to that, I was an English teacher in the district for 16 years. Um, I, I retired in 2018. Uh, but I retired uh, or rewired as one of our friends once coined it. Um, so I went to work at uh, Stockton supervising student teachers, thanks to Jean Del Coley's um, contact there. She brought me in there. And then I, so I still do that currently. Um, I typically take two to three student teachers a semester. Um, I also teach at Rowan. I know Terrence, your son just graduated from there. Congratulations again to you. Also, Nicole for TCNJ. Um, I teach in the education department at, uh, at Rowan University. I, my favorite class is um, teaching reading and uh, writing to, in content area. So I get all different types of students. Um, and I also work um, as a consultant uh, in the New Jersey Department of Education. And I've worked with a couple of the people on this panel in the uh, principal's leadership um, panel. I'll go next. Um, so again, I'm Terrence Johnson. I am currently an assistant principal at Cumberland Regional High School. This is actually my alma mater. So it was really neat coming back to teach. Uh, I'm sorry, to be an administrator at the high school where I actually attended. Uh, kind of weird because some of the teachers that were actually, that taught me were here when I came back. In terms of my background, when I graduated Cumberland Regional, I earned a full football scholarship to the Citadel, the military college in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, after leaving there, I got my degree in health and physical education and I came back to Bridgeton and uh, I actually taught at, in Bridgeton, uh, Indian Avenue Elementary. I taught phys ed for 10 years and I was a high school coach. I coached football, tra uh, track and baseball. And uh, after teaching for 10 years, I wanted to get into administration. So I got my master's degree uh, in school leadership from Rowan and I was an assistant principal at William Davies Middle School for four years. And then this position opened and I started uh, as an assistant principal here in 2007. And I've been here ever since. Thank you. I'll go next. Uh, my name is Tammy McHale. I'm the principal of Haddonfield Memorial High School. I didn't have the most traditional path to becoming the uh, principal here. I started at Cumberland Regional as well as a school psychologist. Uh, then I went to Clearview after a year at Cumberland uh, as a school psychologist, became the supervisor of special ed, and then I was the director of special services at, at Clearview. Um, was just pursuing what other options were out there. I don't like feeling like I have to be in one spot forever. I like to pursue and look at what other options are. And I wanted to work uh, directly with the students as the director. We were in the central office. And I really wanted to roll up my sleeves and work uh, with the students more. So I became the Dean of Students at Haddonfield. Uh, loved it, best job, uh, worked with the activities and worked with the students. Uh, did that for one year and then became the interim principal um, at the high school and then became the principal 
Um, so it's been an interesting ride to say the least, but um, I'm enjoying it. I guess I'll go next. Sorry. You want go ahead, Nicole. Okay. I'm Nicole Moore. I'm currently the principal of Indian Mill School in Shimong, New Jersey. Um, I've been there 20 years. April 1st, I actually celebrated 20 years. I know you're looking at me like, she doesn't look like she's been there. That long. I probably started when I was like 15, oh, oh. but I've just celebrated my 20th year in April. Um, I started my career. Um, I knew that I wanted to be in education. Both of my parents are retired school administrators. So I came right out of college and I taught first grade and second grade in Mount Laurel. That's the town I grew up in. And um, while I was there, my district was just very, very kind. And I left to go to school and got my master's, went away, got my master's in Boston. And then I came back as a non-tenure teacher, worked another year. And after that, I was able to leave. So I actually was in education as a teacher only for about six years. So the majority of my career, this is the 30th year of my career. I can't believe I'm saying that as well either. This is my 30th year and I spent only about six years as a teacher. The majority of my uh, career has been in administration when I left teaching, I went to Princeton Regional Schools and I was actually the program administrator for um, Princeton Young Achievers, which is, they have a series of after school, or they did at the time, after school learning centers that were located in their uh, affordable housing areas of Princeton. Many people didn't know that they have affordable housing areas in Princeton, but these students had the greatest need. Um, so at that time we were providing technology assistance for them. Boy, it seems like the dark ages, but this was in the uh, late nineties. Um, technology assistance built to them, and we had teachers and tutors in the learning centers for those students. I spent a year there, and then I um, progressed to being becoming a vice principal, an assistant principal in Blackwood in an elementary school, Gloucester Township. That school had about 780 students at the time. It was very large compared to where it had been, and I had spent about four years there, and then in 2001, I started an Indian Mill School in Shemung. It is actually in the sending district of where I grew up. I grew up in Lenape region. I graduated from Lenape High School. The kids at, um, from my school district go to Seneca High School in the area, but it's very, very different from where I grew up. And we can talk about that later. It's a very homogenous community, very, very homogenous community. And they don't look like me. Mm. And it's been a very interesting ride. And I'm very proud of where I am because I also bring a lot of diversity and experience to those children that normally would not have interaction with anybody other than themselves. So that's a conversation in itself. Mm. Thank you. Buddy, uh, my name is Jean Muzi and I started out in a completely different profession. Um, I am late to teaching compared to a lot of my colleagues here. Um, I actually graduated from college with a degree in graphic design and worked in advertising and corporate communications my first career. Um, I started volunteering in a local elementary school after my children went to school, and I found this was just an incredible place to be. I went back to Ryder University and got my teaching certification. I taught first grade for over a decade. Um, there's nothing better than first grade for anybody looking at elementary school, right? Um, and then I actually was courted by my superintendent to revamp and recreate um, our gifted and talented program, which I did for seven years across district in four elementary schools. And the more I found out about moving initiatives forward and really empowering teachers, I found out that that um, position is really in the administration. You wanna get things done, you definitely need to step into that role. So I actually did my administrative certificate at um, NJPSA, which is the New Jersey Principal and Supervisors Association, um, which was a great program for me because it got me to work very closely with some of my colleagues as they mentored me in um, not classroom as much as in the schools. And three years ago, I became principal of Slackwood Elementary School here in Lawrence, the same district I have worked in. Um, and this is a Title I school, um, a rich, culturally diverse school with incredibly hardworking kids. Um, I have learned more in the last 15 months working through this pandemic with these children and their families and my colleagues than I could have ever imagined. Well, thank you very much. Abby, why don't you go ahead and ask the next question? Okay, um, 
So what we're wondering is what aspects about your career as an administrator do you enjoy the most? Are there any unexpected perks that when someone thinks of an administrator, they don't really think of? And then to counter that, what's the biggest challenge of being an administrator? I'll tell you, the absolutely best part is being with students. I mean, there's, I think everybody could agree, um, getting out of your office, being with students, getting into the classroom, seeing what's happening, what teachers are accomplishing in their rooms is incredible. That's the best part for me. Um, the worst part is paperwork. I'm terrible. I drown in paperwork and, um, you know, basically procrastinate through any paperwork that I need to do. I think the best part of an administrator, and it's actually the reason why I haven't advanced to becoming a principal, is if I didn't have day-to-day -day interaction with students, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't enjoy my job. I love my job, but the, the interaction with the children, with the students, I'm sorry, is really what makes me feel alive. It's the reason that I get up every day. Um, it's the reason that I love what I do so much. So kind of similar to what Tammy said, but she was the Dean of Students. Like my interaction with the students, like I'll tell you a story. So I'm driving in my inner town and I'm at a stoplight and a car is in front of me and a guy maybe 6'4", 240, grown adult, gets out of the car, comes to me, reaches through my window and hugs me. And I taught him in elementary school. But the minute he saw me, he got out of his car and it's been so long, I had forgotten his name. But <laughs> the amount of love and the impulse that he felt to get out of that car and to come and to give me that hug. And it basically said, you know, that 30 seconds said, you made a difference in my childhood. I'm a grown adult. I got so much love for you. I'm going to get out of the car in the middle of traffic and I'm going to come and I'm going to hug you. So I love my job. I love all the aspects of my job. I teach, I, I am sorry, I'm an assistant principal. My other two assistant principals are my very best friend in life. I spend more time with them than I spend with my own family. The fact that we get along so well, the fact that I'm 20 years older than them and you wouldn't know it when you see us spend time with each other. Um, the fact that when we drive home, um, we talk to each other about the fact that all of us reflect on our day. So but the very, very best part of my job is the interaction with the kids. And I have a theory, it's called the vending machine theory. You don't help other people to get something back. If you do, then you're doing it for the wrong reasons. So sometimes you put your money in that vending machine and you're not gonna get anything back or sometimes you don't get it back for six months, but then you realize I'm not putting it in to get something back. So I'm gonna talk about a mentoring program that I started here a while ago and that the second class of mentors, that was over eight years ago. One of my mentors, I just saw that he graduated from medical school. And like, I almost cried because I, I had a connection with him and I was so proud of him and I was proud of him like he was my own kid. And so that's really what makes me feel alive. And I think the hardest part is that, and I think other people will agree, we don't have a magic wand. So I met with a girl uh, last week because of virtual learning, she was failing all of her courses. And I met with her and, I, and, and we're, we're meeting with them to kind of figure out and have face-to-face -face conversations with them to find out what's going on. And when I met with her, I said, I see that you're failing for your, for your class. Really nice girl, I'm like, what's going on? She said, well, life's been kind of hard since my mom passed away in March. She's a junior. And at that time, I wish I had a magic wand just to make everything better. So you, what do you say to that girl during that time? And so that, that's very humbling to try to help kids where it's no easy answer to try to help them. That's, to, for me, the toughest part of our job because she deserves to have her mom here today. So just things like that. Wow, how do I follow that up? <laughs> Other than to say our jobs are incredible and dealing with little people, I really enjoy my young people because my, ch my school starts with preschool and we go up to fourth grade. And um, I absolutely enjoy working with folks that young. I think for me, it kind of brought its full circle. I mean, I have been at the school 20 years. So now I actually have the first time in my first grade, I have one of my students' um, child. 
And I never expected that. Yeah, I have one of, I have one. And it's funny dealing with him because I have to go all the way back to speaking like the principal because sometimes he still needs to hear that even as the parent. Um, but I did see two of my students at TC and J. My daughter graduated, I mentioned that. She graduated last week. And as I'm listening to the names being called, two of my students from kindergarten that I had from kindergarten are in her graduating class. I walked up to each of them. Their families were ecstatic. I was ecstatic to see them. And I needed to feel that warm fuzzy because it's been a difficult 15 months. And I didn't always feel very appreciated most a lot of this 15 months. And so seeing that reminded me that this is why I do what I do. They were so excited to see me and I was so proud of them. And I, in standing in front of me are 21 and 22 year olds that I remember when they were five. That is absolutely part of the best, the best part of what I do. Another thing is I, I was interviewing today for, I have two positions available and I have had some incredible long-term subs that have worked this year. One of, the, one of the people that I'm interviewing actually was a mother who was one of our parents. While she was, you know, she was an incredible mom. She was an incredible volunteer for PTO. And during this whole journey, I watched her. She wanted to become a teacher and she talked to me about that. And she said, I think I want to be a teacher. Like she too was in graphic design. You two should meet Jean. She did graphic design and um, she decided to go back to school and she became a teacher and she did her student teaching in my school and she's an incredible educator. And I think another reason that drives me is seeing handing off to the next generation and seeing people who want to do what we do because they want, they, they desire to have the same kind of impact on young people. And they have such a need to, um, to impact folks, you know, to edu to become educators and become teachers. So for me, not only are the children, but the generation of younger educators coming behind me, that excites me. It truly excites me that we have the hand and she was thankful to me for being a mentor and I didn't even really consider myself a mentor to her, but she said, you've been such a mentor and you helped me decide in my next phase that she said this was her third career. She had the first one in graphic, then she was a mom at home for a while and now she's back as a teacher as her children are a little bit older. That part is just absolutely amazing. The paperwork, I can agree. Whoever did the paperwork, like I, I have so many summatives to write and someone today said, Three more weeks, three more Mondays, and then we're out of school. And I just wanted, my head wanted to explode. So tonight I will be working on some more summatives because I am behind. I spent a little too much time celebrating a graduate from TCNJ. <laughs> I'll just, Thank you. Uh, because I, I want to echo the same sentiments that my colleagues have said. I think we all are, you know, it's about the connection with our students. It's about that human connection. And then um, I'm a, my position was a little bit different because I moved away. I was in my own district and I moved from being a classroom teacher. I'm in a department chairperson and I moved across the dreaded parking lot to the dark side um, in the same district. Um, and then while it was interesting because all of a sudden here I was a teacher and that was one of the challenges because most of the people in the building were not educators or had not been educators. Um, so I was really the teacher voice in that central office. But it was amazing to me that all of a sudden, because I had this new title, people listened to me. And it, it was a double-edged sword. It was kind of cool because, oh, wow, all of a sudden now people think you know things. You didn't, I didn't know anything that I didn't know when I was on the other side of the parking lot. But now I came across and all of a sudden like, well, what's the answer? And I was like, well, you know, when I was a teacher, you never asked me what was the answer. And teachers hold the answers. So I think one of the greatest things in addition to the student relationships was realizing how to balance the teacher relationship and listen to teachers' voices because teachers know better and kids than most of us who are a parking lot away. Um, I applaud all of you because you got to have that day-to-day -day interaction. And I had to force myself to continue to be able to have that. So I never, or almost never went to my building in the beginning of the day. I still, we had two schools, a middle school and a high school. And I started almost always in one of them. Uh, because I didn't want to lose that connection with kids. I, w I continued to go to um, some athletic events, but especially with visual and performing arts, the kids would take me on the trips with them. I'd volunteer to be a chaperone. Um, and it was interesting because when I would get back to the office, and I usually didn't get there till closer to noon because I spent so much time, my superintendent would say, you need to get on this because this is happening in the building. I'm like, I already took care of that because I was present in the building. And some of that was done from selfish motivation because I just couldn't stand to lose that human contact and especially the kids. Um, but that was a huge challenge. And I, and I guess the other big challenge was, you know, the fact that teachers weren't being listened to. So I worked really hard to put in a lot of teacher leadership programs to give teachers a voice. And, and every decision that I made always was made in conjunction with feedback from them. 
everyone took my answer uh, about the students and not, and not to be redundant, but that's really why you major in what you major in and go to school with what for what you go to school with is, is we didn't go into this to create widgets. We came in here to, to deal with humans, but as rewarding as it is, it's the most challenging part of the job as well because I have 870 students that are somebody's pride and joy, their baby. So my product has a lot of emotion that comes with it. Parents are very emotional, obviously. As a parent, I know how that feels. So I think that that, that helps lead decisions and how we handle things, knowing that this is the most important person to, to this family. So, um, you know, it comes with a lot of, I think, difficult conversations sometimes. Um, but this year in particular, and Nicole, you had mentioned it, I think it's, it's interesting to do this panel now. It would probably be a lot different a year ago uh, because it has been a very challenging year. And you definitely don't go into education or administration wanting uh, thanks or a pat on the back. Um, at all. This year, it's been a little challenging. You know, you'll do something, you'll be so proud of it. We, we're, we're making gains, we're full capacity, and then you're still, you're still getting that negative response or that negative feedback. And so that's been a little exhausting. Um, but at the end of the day, seeing all the students back in school, thrilled to be here, appreciating things that they didn't appreciate in the past has been extremely rewarding. And uh, I look forward to continuing to grow and, and to get back to as much um, restored from what we lost uh, is exciting to see too. But uh, for me, it's been, you know, it's been an up and down year, I think for most of us. Mm -hmm. uh, on the higher ed level as well, I can verify all around, it's been a doozy of a year, year and a half. So mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna kind of move on with this next question. There are all different types of leadership styles. And so, uh, you know, as you all are leading within your buildings or, or we're leading within the district, um, you know, it, it takes uh, specific personality traits to be a good leader. Uh, so what qualities of your personality do you think work to your advantage as a school leader? And uh, what qualities do you think got you hired for the job that you're, you're currently in or the last job that you were in if you're retired? I, I can quickly go. Um, go I think for me, um... So I've been in education for 22 years, lots of different roles, saw a lot of principals and leaders. I think one of the things that I like to do is work uh, with my facilitators, with the teaching facilitators. We have eight, um, they represent each department. So I think for me, transparency has been the most important thing. And I know it sounds cliche, but it really is. Um, I just share the situation and I hear all their perspectives and they're advocating for their departments and they know at the end of the day the decision may not go in their favor because sometimes just eight people can't agree on you know a schedule or or an idea so think about when you when you take that to the entire faculty and staff you know clearly you're you're not always going to have full agreement but hearing their perspective um, I think means a lot and and helps drive those decisions, even though that you can't always make everyone happy. And I think that was the hardest part to get used to is you can't always make uh, everyone happy. Um, I think for me, the position here is uh, I became the principal. I think my psychology background and working in the central office my entire career helped. Uh, knowing where the process ended um, helped deal with coming back into the building and working in the building and seeing the whole student um, not just not just the classes they take or you know we were dealing with a lot of uh, issues that i think everyone is dealing with with social emotional well-being and um just our human dignity units that we've been doing and and so with that i think it just helps to be there and listen to the students i when i first got the job i the the son came out and they interviewed and were asking questions i said an open door policy i just want people to come in and about six months into it my assistant was like do you ever regret that quote on, on you know and your picture with your hands open in front of the school and i'm like sometimes i do because it is definitely a crazy whirlwind but i think it's important to be um approachable and and so that's you know kind of my goal my path was, um, oh, I'm sorry, no, go ahead, Diane. Uh, my path was interesting. Um, having a background in athletics and playing college football and also going to a military college. Um, so when I started interviewing 
for administrative positions at that at that point in time, not having any um, experience as an administrator and only knowing one side of the interview uh, process, bring on the other side. I remember I interviewed four times before I was actually hired. And the first interview was horrible. <laughs> and I kind of went back and I kind of really prepared. Those who fail to prepare better prepare to fail. I learned that. So then my second, third, and fourth interview, I thought I aced them. And I walked away thinking, I am going to get hired. I walked away confident like the confident man I am. And I, and I didn't get that call back. And um, I, didn't make, I didn't let it shake my confidence. But when I was hired um, in my fifth interview, um, once I was hired, I realized that a lot of times what people are looking for on the other side, it's almost like they're looking for something specific that fits in their puzzle. And I also learned that maybe I, I wasn't so much what they weren't looking for. I just, for the other positions, I wasn't what they were looking for. And when I was hired, it's funny because um, my interview in May's Landing, I walked in and the superintendent, her name was Sharon Reardon. And she looked at me and said, Terrence Johnson, she goes, I remember you when you were three years old and you moved to Bridgeton. And she said, you graduated from the Citadel. That's how the interview started. And I didn't even know who she was, but I didn't know her family, but come to find out um, uh, that school district, Hamilton school district was looking for, one of the things that they were looking for was an administrator to be in charge of their new alternative program. And I think that they kind of felt like they needed someone who had a strict background, who could deal with tough kids. And I think that, you know, um, my background kind of fit what they were looking for. Um, so a lot of times I think it's just kind of the right fit. Um, in terms of my approach, I am uh, very, very, very driven. Um, you can take the Citadel away, you can take the man away from the Citadel, but you can't take the Citadel totally away from the man. So I still live my life with a code. At the Citadel, they had, they had an honor code, thou shalt not lie, cheat or steal or tolerate those who, who do. So, you know, I try to convey that, but I also have a very paternal uh, approach to uh, when I'm dealing with kids. Um, I was lucky enough to have um, two parents who were married for 51 years before my mother passed away and I had the perfect family and even being ed being um, educated doesn't prevent you from being naive. So when I started teaching, I still to a certain level thought that everybody had two good loving parents like I did. And when I started teaching in Bridgeton, I was humbled at some of the backgrounds of these kids. So like I take a very paternal approach to what I, uh, what I do. I'm very strict. Uh, I'm driven, but I do take a very paternal approach because I, I kind of want to provide them what they're kind of missing um, and what they don't have. I, I try to even the scale a little bit. So that's kind of like my approach. I'll jump in. Um, I think Terrence hit on some things, you know, talking about confidence and talking about being driven. And I am in, was in a really unique position. I went from the classroom to the central office. Um, that doesn't happen very often. And I really didn't even, they, administration found me. I wasn't looking for it. Um, and as Jean said before, I had been the um, 2004 New Jersey State Teacher of the Year. And I think when I went back into school, they were like, well, is she gonna go somewhere? What's gonna happen? So the wonderful thing for some of the people that I, administrators that I looked up to and the qualities that they had, they sort of like let you go with the ideas that you had. So I've always been kind of somebody who thinks a little bit out of the box, has some different ideas. And I've had superintendent and assistant superintendent said, run with that. So I started a coaching program in my school way before coaching was cool. Um, so uh, instructional coaching. So we're talking about like 2004, 2005, we were doing instructional coaching. So I'm spending half my day doing that. And it happened that the superintendent was going to retire. The assistant superintendent wound up taking his spot and said to me, came to me and said, what do you think about coming over to this office? And I'm like, really? This is so I, a lot of times I've thought back, so why did they think I could do that other than the fact that they thought I might leave? Um, and I think it had to do with, you know, it's that follow through. I would say I would say something and then I would do it. 
Um, so when I would see an initiative, you know, I came up with some ideas, you know, my husband, we always tease, like even a blind squirrel finds a nut every once in a while. So I would come up with some kind of crazy idea and my superintendent would get out of the way. And so I tried to be that same person when I went into administration. I did it when I was a classroom teacher. Kids would say to me, you know, I don't really like that, you know, research paper that we have to do. So I'd say, well, give me an idea of something we could do instead that still would show me that you could, you know, show, de develop research skills. So I think listening to people is probably one of the greatest skills, being honest, and then carrying through with what you say you'll do. And I think when you do those things, people see you as a truthful human being. They see you have that, and you're approachable, like Tammy had talked about in the beginning. It's that humanistic piece that people know, and, they tr and the, the big word is they trust you. You know, you only have to screw up one time for people not to trust you. You have to work really hard and do things again and again and become, and that, and then you earn people's trust. So I think those are some of the important things that I feel that are, you know, qualities of a strong administrator, strong, strong teacher, strong human being. Tammy, you're right. Everybody took the good answers already. So <laughs> we've all learned, don't go near, near the end. Um, you guys all said it perfectly. Um, like Diane, my friend actually calls me the accidental administrator. I never ever sought to be sitting in this, you know, chair. Um, but I think that what everybody said, and especially at the end there, Diane mentioned about trust, um, about being someone that teachers and kids and families can count on. Um, and I think that was with my, you know, when I interviewed for this position, it was seen as a leap. But I think my um, colleagues and, you know, the hiring committee and everyone, I'm a doer. I will get it done. I will figure out ways of getting it done. So being a doer, being someone that you can count on. And I think for um, a school like mine, you know, uh, Terrence was saying his, he's in a big school. Tammy's in a big, big school. Um, you know, but Nicole and I with little people, um, you know, I only, I only have 220 something kids here right now. Um, and they're needy kids. So I will fight for them. I will make sure that at the end of the day that I will be their champion always. And I think that's what you need to remember every single day, we are champions for our kids. Thank you very much. And Abby's going to move on now. We've got some individual questions for you based on your, your backgrounds and biography. So Abby, take it away. Yeah, so like she said, we have a couple individual questions. And we've talked a lot um, today about how the different approaches to becoming an administrator, like there's so many different ways and so many different paths you can take. So I wanted to ask um, you, Tammy, how your background in psychology shaped your teaching and leadership style? Because everyone comes from a different type of place, but how did psychology work for you? So for for my whole career, I think that part of it, well, part of it started as a school psychologist. So it was pretty direct on how it in, in, input uh, impacted that. But as a dean of students, I found that to be um, such a huge part of my background. And I think, um, you know, everything was trending with the restorative justice, and it really just came pretty natural to me as a psychologist. Um, I think just going from the mindset of um, you have four years in high school to make mistakes and it not define you. And what really is defining you is how you pick yourself up, brush yourself off, and how you grew and learned from those mistakes. So that's really the philosophy I took as a dean. Um, with our discipline now, sometimes mistakes come with consequences. It doesn't mean there's not consequences, but as long as they're fair and equitable um, and there's that learning piece, that's the biggest thing for me um, for, for most of it. So I think it, it really influenced how I handled um, the dean of students job where you're working with students, uh, some of the discipline. Now as the principal, I think it drives some of the decisions on how I run the school or we run the school. Um, my, our team really has to look at the whole student and that background helps. Um, I'm in a very high achieving high school. Uh, students take a lot of hard level classes. I think the the number one issue that people don't realize is the amount of stress and anxiety our students are under. Uh, so trying to help navigate that, we just had eighth grade transition day today and they're gonna be coming in and picking their classes as freshmen and, and, and starting their high school journey. And for me, it's really important that they think of everything. You have to think about where you are in your life in that moment. Um, what courses you're taking, what extracurricular you're involved in, what your family life is like, and balance that and um, try not to handle 
internalize it where you're where it's coming out is is a stressful environment. Um, we see a lot of uh, stress, I think, probably across the board over the last 15 months, the anxiety, um, suicide ideation, issues that our students were dealing with, that's what you should be focusing on as a building administrator. So I think that background has really helped me. I have curriculum experts. Every single teacher in the building is a curricul curricular ex expert, a curriculum expert, and, and our resources to me. So, um, you know, it is a unique background, but I think it does help drive with student first uh, initiatives. We'll be starting a new bell schedule next year. And some of it was to just slow down. You know, we have students who are taking eight classes and going through their day. Um, and we're just trying to decrease transition and help them manage their time. 90% of my students are involved in extracurricular and it's time consuming. You know, they're up until one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, getting homework done. So we're just trying to build things in to help them manage it. I think sometimes what they do here at Haddonfield is almost more demanding than what they'll have in college. So, you know, helping them with that balance has been uh, a priority to us um, and dealing with that. So I think that's one, one thing. And then the other, the other program we started was our peer bias program, um, which I'm very proud of. And this year, the Dean of Students and I, he did a lot of the groundwork, but we, we had our first equity summit with seven other neighboring districts, and it was just amazing. Um, the demographic here is, is, you know, there's not a whole lot of diversity. So when you're learning about it, it's, it's better to do it in a way where you see that students that might not look like you uh, are still like you and have similarities. So we've been working really hard to do that and develop programs for that. So um, for me, I think that's, that's where it's helped, uh, you know, working with the staff and the students. Thank you so much. And um, Welcome, Abby. Mr. Johnson, what inspired you to create the program that allows seniors to help freshmen begin developing a successful high school career? Uh, the program is called Freshman Seminar slash Senior Mentoring. And to be honest with you, in my educational career, it's the best thing that I've ever been a part of. Uh, ironically, the way that it started 11 years ago, the superintendent at that time during the summertime said, Terrence, I want you to start a mentoring program in the middle of summer. I'm like, Okay, <laughs> that's all he really gave me. And so I'm sitting at a uh, workshop with my principal at the time, and there was someone who was putting on a presentation about a mentoring program called Freshman Seminar at a high school in the area. And my principal uh, kind of wrote on a piece of paper, his name is John Mitchell, he was the best boss I've ever had. And he slid over, he said, mentor. So then I spoke to the presenter at the end of the uh, workshop, and it really sounded like something that we wanted to do. But instead of starting it that year, because I found out that the success of, of what you, uh, of a program that you, that you start really has a lot to do with how much work you put into it to, to build it up. And you don't want to start things too early. So that, in, that entire next year, I spent an entire year after I put a committee together and we basically researched that program. We went and visited the school once uh, a month and interviewed everyone and just found out as much as we could about the program. We started the program the next year. The reason we started it is we want to help freshmen in their transition into high school be successful. And the statistics say that nationally ninth grade is the most difficult transition uh, year in, in the academic lives of our children. The greatest failure rate in high school occurs in ninth grade. Students who fail the ninth grade are 50% less likely to graduate from high school. And 45% of dropouts report that they entered high school unprepared for rigorous studies. And so based on that, all that, we wanted freshmen to start off high school off on the right foot. So what we did was we find seniors in our school, I'm sorry, juniors in our school that have had really successful high school careers. And what we do is we almost, if you picture a rainforest and based on the paths in that rainforest, we have paths to success and paths to failure. And these juniors, have chosen the right path. They're almost like tour guides. So basically they go back to the beginning of the forest and they take these freshmen and they take them under their wing and they help them start their high school career. So they help them socially, intellectually, and emotionally throughout their high school career, but mainly uh, in a course, their freshman year, they are actually physically in class with these freshmen, 84 minutes, helping shape their freshman year. And what it also allowed me to do, which is really, I think, it allowed me to get to know 
really closely the leaders in our school. And it helps us shape those leaders. And had this program not started, assistant principals normally don't deal with these really successful students. It allowed me to really develop phenomenal relationships. So everybody here on the panel, we're all leaders, right? We probably have different leadership styles, but like I'm no better, my style is no better than Nicole's and Nicole's is no better than Jean's and Tammy's and Diane's. And that's the beauty of it is that we find diversity in, every, in all of our leaders, leadership styles, abilities, everything. And we, it allows us to be able to shape those leaders. That gentleman that I said that just graduated from medical school, he was a senior mentor, which was really, really cool. And so, yeah, it is, it is the reason that I'm sitting here now. My boss, his name is Ralph Aiello. He's my principal. Nicole knows Ralph really well. And uh, I'm the kind of person where I really don't care about what other people know what I'm, I'm doing. If I know I'm doing the right thing, I don't care about what the rest of the world can see or not because I don't do it so that they can see. If I'm doing the right thing, I know about it. And Ralph knows I'm like that. But he felt like people need to know about this mentoring program. They need to know about the good things that you're doing. It's the only reason that I got the Assistant Principal of the Year Award. Ralph felt like people needed to know about the things that I'm doing. And it's really the reason that I'm sitting here today. It is the very best part of my job. Oh, thank you. And did you face any like other obstacles in becoming a teacher and administrator? And if so, what were they? <clears throat> um, the obstacles is interesting. The one obstacle that I faced that I that was, was a a reality to me is that unfortunately um, stereotypes and racism is everywhere and it's on both sides. And so I remember when I was a phys ed teacher, I had a unique approach to phys ed. I would actually read to my kids. I would read chicken soup for the soul, poems and stories. I would relate whatever we did in phys ed to the theme of the story. So then that actually inspired me to start writing my own poems. And I would write poems to actually try to empathize with some of the kids and what they were dealing with in their lives. So I shared a poem with one of my GNT uh, phys ed class and the kid liked it so much, he wanted to take a copy of it, he wanted to take it home. So he took it back to his classroom and the teacher looked at it having no idea that I wrote it. And uh, she took it and she ripped it up and said, this is trash. So then I went back to her to speak to her about the fact that she ripped up what she ripped up was my poem and her comment was, oh, you're not mad at me. You're not going to slice my tires, are you? And she teaches uh, these kids. So that like was an eye opening experience, but I use that for fuel to open people's eyes more and to do the right thing. It's actually one of the things that kind of motivated me to become an administrator. So turn a negative situation into a positive. So my favorite quote actually is find the gift in pain. Find something positive out of a negative situation. And so I use it as a teachable moment to, to that student. I use that, how that teacher reacted as a teachable moment to that student uh, to never judge. Wow, that's, that's a great lesson for every student. Miss um, Moore, how did your student experience impact your leadership goals for Indian, Indian Mills School? My student experience, so all through school, I actually was um, probably that kid that was a teacher pleaser. And when I get to high school, I was actually a student leader. I enjoyed every aspect of high school. I enjoyed, um, I was a class officer for three of my four years. I just enjoyed being involved with where I was. And so as far as how it, how it affected me as my own leadership, I would just say that my goal is to, um, to grow every student that I come in contact with, to encourage them to, to reach for, you know, unlimited potential and things that they would seem that are out of reach for them. In particular, where I am, I mentioned it a little earlier in my intro. I, I'm like Tammy, I work in a place that's very, very homogenous. I'm in a very small rural community, 98.9% .9 white. And then there's me as a principal for 20 years. And so what, with me being there, it's, it, there I, I could just tell you some stories, but what I can tell you is that I, I know for a fact that I've positively impacted that community because there are children in that community that will have never ever interacted with anybody outside of themselves or anybody that looks outside of them. I think for my leadership when I get up and I go every day, um, I think about that. I think about how I, how I inspire you know, those children. 
in ways that I don't even know. Actually, my son is um, a high school student at Lenape High School and two of his teachers this year are actually my former students. I don't use my married name, I use a professional name. So his last name is not the same as mine and that most people don't know that. And I purposely didn't say anything. We didn't have real back to school night this year because it was virtual. And I, and I watched them online and about after the first marking period, I emailed both of them to let them know that I was so proud of them. Um, and then one teacher, I could actually hear her because at some points we were at home together learning. He was in another room and I, she's phenomenal. She's a phenomenal, phenomenal teacher and she's doing an outstanding job. And the email that she sent back to me really impacted me so positively about how I was one of her role models and how she went into education because I was one of the people that inspired her for that. I would have never known that. So my leadership there is just being, I didn't get a chance to answer the last question about being trans, I'm definitely transparent. I kind of tell it like it is with anybody that comes in and I'm always in it for the kids. I make the best decisions for the interests of children. I don't care if you've lived in the town since 1955, I don't care if you own one of the many wineries that lives out there. I don't care if you're third generation Shemung. I've gotten that on some of the letters that people sign me. Third generation, I don't care. I have kids that are migrant, parents of migrant workers and they all have the same rights. And I fight for that migrant child's rights just as well as the third generation that lives out there. So I think as a leader, I'm kind of, I can say, and, and Terrence probably knows I'm a little bit in your face at times. I'm in your face because I know what's right. And I do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. And I will continue to do that for all kids, no matter who they are. Thank you, that's, that's a great mindset for any administrator. Um, Ms. Moosey, as an NJ State Teacher of the Year, how did your perspective on education kind of shift now that you're an administrator? Or what was that shift like? I, I honestly, you know, like preach Nicole, you know, like honestly, I feel the same way. I don't think my, um, perspective did shift that much. Um, as a teacher, I, I knew of the life-changing power of education. And if anything, that's even stronger now. Um, you know, in, in an elementary school, every day, you know, makes a tremendous difference, you know, in a child's life. And I know with older kids too, but like, you know, I think about like some of my little guys, like, Today could be the day they learn to read or they, they finally are able to make a friend, you know, like there's all these enormous milestones. So I, as my, my teacher lens is the same as my administrator lens, that this is vitally crucial, important work. It's literally the most important work that, that we're all involved with. Um, and, you know, we can't, and that's what was probably so hard about you know, the pandemic that everyone was struggling with so many different pieces of, you know, the educational puzzle that some of those vitally important moments were harder, you know, to, to, to attain or to, to be able to help our kids in different ways. So, um, no, I don't think my educational perspective changed much between a teacher and an administrator. You know, I guess I had a hard time when I first became an administrator and people like, I met people and they would say, you know, what do you do? And like right away, I'm like, I'm a teacher. And, um, you know, I don't ever want to stop thinking that first. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. Um, Ms. Cummins, as an NJ State Teacher of the Year also, how did your student and teacher interactions change when you became an administrator? I'm probably going to sound a lot like um, Jean Muzi here uh, because I still was the same person. And I think that people, well, first of all, when you get the luck of becoming a New Jersey State teacher, um, you aut it automatically comes some, with some baggage when you go back to your school, you get a six month sabbatical and people who know you and knew you well, know, they knew that you were still the same person when you came back. And they knew because you took so many opportunities to highlight your school, your colleagues, give opportunities to your students that you might not have had before. You know, we all recognize that we weren't the best teacher in the state. We just happened to get the luck of the draw that year. Um, so I, I tried the year that I was, the half year that I was out to bring as many people on board with me. So we, they already got a chance to do some leadership types of activities. So a year later, when I moved into administration, um, I was still me. So I think what people that I didn't necessarily interact with a whole lot, because obviously schools are like, you know, teachers have their groups of people, whether it's their department 
or people that they, you know, they get along with, they teach in the same hallway. Um, they all knew you. But then it was having to prove myself more or less to the people who didn't know me. And the same thing, you know, they would be, and I'm, you know, kind of like Nicole said, I, I'm like in your face, like I'm very blunt, like I'm not going to be a different person when I sit with a group of administrators than I'm going to be when I sit with a group of parents or students. So I don't ever have to forget, you know, or remember who I am because I'm always the same person, you know, and if you don't like what you see, then I'm sorry, but this is what I have to offer. Um, so it was interesting though, because some kids actually thought it was like the coolest thing because now they had somebody in the central office. And there were times that teachers would call me and say, there's something really going badly in the building or whatever. And the kids aren't comfortable to talk to another administrator. They'd like to talk to you. Like, and that, as much as it was a tough thing to handle, um, you know, and then balancing that with other administrators or the building administrators, you know, that made me feel good that I still had that connection and kids still felt me as that teacher. Um, and probably the biggest thing, I guess, uh, you know, kind of going back to that whole the interaction with kids, I talked about that before. I hated losing that day-to-day -day interaction. So I, I would not let that happen. And then in addition to just spending time there, I started thinking about, like, where's the kid's voice? You know, it's funny because you, some of you are talking about the, the metaphors and the different things you have. I always use this metaphor about furniture. You know, so the cheapest furniture, the most horrible furniture in the district usually goes to the kids. Then the teachers get the next crappiest furniture. And then you move over to the central office and they have these beautiful cherry desks. I remember when I moved there, they're like, well, what new furniture do you want? I'm like, why do I want furniture? I don't plan to be here a whole lot. I want to be in the buildings. And if you're going to spend money, spend it on the kids, that classrooms, the kids and teachers, that's where it's supposed to happen. So I kept thinking about that, you know, like, okay, so what are we going to do? How are we going to give kids a bigger voice in schools? And so I created every opportunity. I created curriculum committees that had kids on them and, and met with kids and said, what's missing from the curriculum, especially like in social studies, uh, you know, because we were, again, also a pretty typical um, relating to both Nicole and Tammy's districts. We were mostly white district. And then each year we were getting a more diverse population and we weren't dealing with them because we are gonna just take care of the majority of our population. And I worked so hard because, and again, just having relationships with kids, they would say to me, you know, I'm not represented in that social studies classroom. So we would bring them, they did professional development for our teachers. We, I, anytime I could find it, a student to bring in for any committee whatsoever, people were like, my superintendent was like, why you have a kid on the teacher of the year committee? I said, why wouldn't we? They're the biggest you know, consumer in our schools. They know everybody better than anybody else. Why do you have kids on a curriculum committee? Because they're, they know what they're missing. So I think my opportunity, you know, it just took time to build those relationships and for people to see I was still me. And then it goes back to what I said like really early about, you know, people think you knew something all of a sudden when you become an administrator, but you got the opportunity to do things and give people a voice that didn't have one before. Alrighty, and thank you. So uh, I'm going to talk about leadership a little bit here. So leadership, uh, we know that great, great leaders don't create followers. Great leaders create other leaders. And we know that education is very cyclical in that uh, usually it's, it's the, the great educators who reach out and tap the next generation to say, hey, have you ever thought about being a teacher? Because you'd make a great teacher someday. So I want all of you to think about in your education journey, um, who was it that inspired you to either become a teacher or an administrator? Do you have that one person that you can look at and point to and say, yep, that, that was the person. That was the one who kind of sent me in that direction. It doesn't have to be an educator necessarily. It could be a family member, uh, could be somebody else. But is there someone in your life that, that you... And, and I like to say, you know, we, we kind of uh, Frankenstein our greatest teachers of all time. So you like, you like the sense of humor on this one and you like the personality on that one and you like the jokes in that one. So you take all of them and you combine them in, in what you've got going on and you kind of come up with your own version of your own superhero teacher self, right? So for all of you, who were your uh, education um, inspiration? Who was your education inspiration? Jean. As I said, I never thought I'd be a teacher. So I don't have one of those experiences from being a kid or a high school kid. So I mentioned that I started volunteering in my son's classroom. That's how I found teaching. And his teacher, um, a kindergarten teacher, her name is Pam Hernandez. And I got to see her in action. And what started as a volunteering situation literally changed my life. 
because I loved my career, what I always thought I would do. And being with her and volunteering in her classroom, I, it opened my eyes to she's actually impacting the future. She's changing lives. She is like literally doing the most important work. And after maybe four or five months of volunteering in her classroom, I was like, that's what I want to do. I'm going to be her. And I'm still friends with her. And she was one of my administrative mentors. Oh, cool. All right, Diane? Um, well, I'm going to name two, sorry. Um, my mom was the person who always said to us, you go out and you be the best that you can be and you give back. And, it, I, and I didn't say this at the beginning. I didn't go back to college to be a teacher until I was 29 years old. I got my bachelor's degree when I was in my early 30s. Um, my mom got to see that. Unfortunately, she passed away when I started the first year at Clearview. But I always realized that she instilled that in me, that love of giving back. And it took me a while to figure out that that was to give back as far as the teacher. The person, though, that I have to talk about just for a minute is um, my former superintendent. His name is Michael Toscano. And he was the guy who believed, he listened to everybody. He he had such great relationships with people and he got out of your way and he made a path so that when he saw you doing something that was really good, he found a way for you to be able to accomplish that. So I tried to bring that into my leadership style. And I think that, you know, that was the same thing. I, I take some, I take great pride in knowing that there were people that I worked with that I hope I hopefully pushed because I believed in them before they believed in themselves, just like he did with me. Thanks, Nicole. Um, I think I mentioned it earlier in my introduction, both of my parents were teachers. I had teachers from a very, very, uh, you know, role models of teachers. And these were the old days. My father was a phys ed coach. So we would often have um, kids from the team when you could bring kids back to your house and you could do that kind of stuff. Um, so we would grow up, we had two girls in our household, my sister and myself. But we would have the basketball team. We would have the track team that would come over because my father was a role model to many of these boys did not have fathers. He worked in Hamilton Township in Mercer County and um, many of his um, boys were right from Trenton. Some of them had moved there from Trenton and they didn't have dads and my dad was like a role model for them and I really really admired that and my mother was at the other end of the state in Woodbury as a teacher and she had students well, that she would bring, literally bring home. I remember we went, to, we took some students in Mississippi with us. My parents were from Mississippi and they actually, we took kids with us. We got in the car and they went to Mississippi with us. When I say back in the day, the old days, we can't even take them around the block now, but we went to Mississippi with some of the students and I could see how much they positively impacted people. My parents are both mid seventies now and we still have my father's people that come and um, call on him for advice. And that to me was just like one of the best things ever. In the beginning, I didn't want to be a teacher, but then I realized what a positive impact we had and how we could literally change people's lives by making sure these children were educated. And I considered it a privilege to be able to do that. Thank you. Terrence. Yeah, when I was younger, I actually didn't, I'm not one of those people who when they were younger, they knew that they wanted to be what they wanted to be when they were younger. <laughs> You know, like when I when I went to college, I thought I was like most guys who get Division One scholarship. I thought I was going to play pro football, and uh, but I, I'm the youngest of three sons. My two older brothers, actually, my oldest brother also went to the Citadel and played football there. So I kind of followed in his footsteps. Both of them became PE teachers, and they were five and six years older than me. So when I got to college, I had to pick a career. <laughs> I picked health and phys ed. And I actually thought I was going to be a physical therapist, but I picked teaching track. Just to, you know, uh, to have that teaching degree in your back pocket. And my uh, second semester, senior year, I did um, six months student teaching for elementary and six months at the high school. And then when I started teaching elementary phys ed, I fell in love. I'm like, I can get paid for this? Are you serious? And I absolutely love elementary school kids. And Nicole and Dean can probably tell you, you either love elementary or you don't, you know, because when I was coaching at the high school, they couldn't believe that I loved and they were trying to recruit me to get at the high school. And I loved it. And I equate them like soft play. They're a lot. And even if their lives aren't good, they're so young and they're blessed with being um, innocent that they don't realize sometimes how bad it is. 
And so they're easier to shape. And I fell in love with teaching uh, elementary PE. And <clears throat> so I didn't have like, and again, my parents, I've been blessed with, I was blessed with the two of the best parents in the whole world. And so when I started teaching, um, like I said, I, I kind of wanted, when I realized that other kids didn't have that at home, I felt like I had a responsibility to try to give them a little bit of what they don't have at home. You don't have to be a parent to care. You don't have to be a parent to try. And that was almost sometimes like waving that magic wand where you're almost saying, look, I know the one that you have at home is not a good one, but I can be somebody that's really important in your life that can help shape your life. And I don't have to be your dad for somebody to help you. And so um, I didn't have like, you know, like I said, my parents really motivated me. My brothers kind of had, um, kind of cleared that path for me to go into education. And my 10 years that I taught element, PE, elementary PE never felt like work. I put on sweats every day and I went and I played with the kids all day. I swung on the, on the swings with them and pushed them and sang songs and jumped off. It never felt like, it never felt like work. Being an administrator, I love, but it feels like work. But being a PE teacher for 10 years elementary was the best. Thank you. Tammy. Um, I don't think I had that one moment either that was, okay, this is what I want. I was inspired by this person. I think um, just, I was a swimmer at Villanova and I think that whole mentality of being on a team and being the captain and, and working together, even though swimming is somewhat individual, it's also a team sport, just made me it made me realize I wanted to do something where I was working with other people with the same end goal in mind uh, and to accomplish things and sprinkle a little competitiveness in there. And um, I think it is how I ended up uh, where I am. It was just a kind of born, born, uh, raised but you know my dad kind of always emphasized that that work ethic and and teamwork as well so I think that just that background and experience I had at Villanova led me uh in this direction more so than a person did and I thank you so much for sharing everyone because I think our students are now realizing that there are many paths to education just because you know it just because you you didn't set up your your dolls or your younger siblings when you were a baby and teach them as like it doesn't mean that you can't be a teacher so teachers come in all shapes and sizes everybody takes a different path to get to to the profession um i i myself was a non-traditional person got a, a degree in political science before deciding to eventually go back and do my thing but it, there's a different route for everyone there's no one correct way of becoming an educator so in thinking about the next generation that's coming along behind you, um, what one piece of advice would you offer to high school students today who want to enter the profession? Make it short, sweet, little, some nice snippet, tidbit, and then we're going to wrap this up. So Jean, go ahead. Um, I would say be a learner. Just be a learner. Um, ask people. I mean, teachers all have their own story of how they got involved, ask, ask your favorite teacher, hey, how did you get here? Or, you know, visit schools, there's, there's people all around, teachers are everywhere. Be a learner, be open and constantly ask questions, be curious. Thank you, Diane. Uh, be prepared to go uh, to dive into the deep end. Don't enter teaching thinking it's a cakewalk because it is not. Uh, be prepared to work hard and if you don't wanna work, the rewards are amazing, but if you don't want to work hard, it's not for you. All right. Thank you, Nicole. Ditto, ditto. <laughs> and I would also say be flexible. One thing I've really learned, and I was talking to some of the young, um, the long-term subs I've had this year, this is their first year or second year. They've had to do things they never, ever imagined that they would have to do in order to reach students. And so I would say definitely be a learner. And, but the flexible part too, is you gotta be flexible and you have to have a passion for it. You cannot go into this career if you do not have a passion for it. Thank you. Terrence. Being in the educational field, I uh, know everyone will test it is, will humble you at one point or another uh, while you're in education. But to be honest with you, there is no better feeling in the world than providing a service to others. 
especially when you're not expecting to get it back. Providing a service to others makes you feel better than making yourself feel good. All right, thank you. And Tammy? I love the flexible, um, especially this year. That was probably the best advice you can give. I think don't be afraid to take risks and make mistakes would be my advice and be okay with revisiting what you did after you have more information. Uh, we're human, we're not perfect. And I think how you handle that is what separates you. So just be okay to uh, mess up a little. Mm -hmm. Yeah, failure is not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. It's what exactly. you do when you fail, right? How right. you recover, yep. All right, well, thank you very much, all of you for joining us today. It really has been great hearing your stories and, and various perspectives uh, and, and good to get sort of a, a mix of, of di different levels and schools and, and, uh, and stories. It has been fantastic. Sure. So, so thank you for joining all of us today. Thank you administrators for taking the time to work with us today. I appreciate everything you do. Abby, you were a fabulous co-host. Thank you so much today. And Womboy, thank you Womboy for, uh, for being the, the person that um, you know, we, we need uh, to help us stay organized and keep everything running. So if you have any questions for us, drop us an email at cfe at tcnj.edu and we're gonna be happy to get back to you. And we hope to see you again soon. So thank you future educators and have a great day.